We're going to now talk about remedies phase of uh, contract law. Um, so, let me put this on. Uh, also, uh, while you are listening to me, uh, Please download the uh, uh, sample contract from uh, Blackboard. Um, I know you can do two things at a time. So uh, um, you can send uh, text messages during lecture. You can do uh, Facebook while uh, listening to lectures. So you should be able to do that at least. Okay. Alright. So hmm? remedies. Okay. Uh, so we talked about uh, three remedies for breach of contract. Now uh, only the innocent party, the party who didn't breach the contract, has those remedies available to that party. The party who breached the contract cannot do anything. Okay. Now, what are those remedies? First, you can terminate the contract. Okay. Now, remember the party that breached the contract. Can the breaching party breach the contract again? Yes. No. Yes. Because. That a contract is breached doesn't mean that contract is defunct or disappears. Contract is st still there before it is terminated. So yes, party can breach a contract and breach again and again and again until it is terminated. So that's where you have to remember the breaching party cannot terminate a contract himself. I mean, when a party breaches a contract, he'll feel like, oh, you know, I messed up. I want to get out of this relationship. I don't, uh, you know, I, I'll be, I, I keep messing up. As long as a contract is alive, I want to get it over with. But the breaching party cannot do, cannot terminate contract. Only the innocent party can do it. Um, now that's why who terminate the contract correctly uh, is an important issue. Because if you terminate it wrongfully, then you are in a bigger breach. You are in a bigger breach than the party who, f who uh, committed the original breach. Now, we talked about liquidated damages. Okay. And we talked about consequential damages. So, if a uh, um, If someone comes to you and says, if a client comes to you and says, oh, I want a, a stringent liquidated damage, as stringent liquidated, liquidated damages clause as possible, you shouldn't easily say yes. Because if the terms of liquidated damages is too stringent, meaning the amount set is too high compared to the actual damages, that resulted from the breach, that liquidated damages clause will become void, will become meaningless. So you want to set it at a level that will not be so unreasonably out of proportion to the actual damages. Now that's a difficult task because you don't know 
it's hard to predict in advance what the actual damages are going to be. But the rule of thumb is if you know, if you know that that amount of damages is almost impossible to result from the breach of that contract, then you shouldn't, you shouldn't set the amount of liquidated, liquidated damages 10 times that amount or 20 times that amount. Okay. Um, you should come down to a level, you should come down to a level or to an amount where you will feel, oh, okay, that amount of damage is something that can probably result from breach of this contract, right? And then multiply that by, you know, five times, six times. Okay, ten times is fine too. But never ever you multiply, never ever you start from an amount that you know is not going to result from breach of the contract. Okay. Um, so think about that. Now the third term that uh, you should be familiar with is repeat happiness, passive damages. What is special damages? Uh, in Korean law, there are terms like 특별 손해 and 통상 손해. And special damages is not 통상 손해. Okay? No, no, it is not typical. Sorry. Special damages is more like Tongsang Sone in the following sense. Special means specifiable damages. What means specifiable? You can specify the amount. How? Because those are the amounts that the party actually spent. So we call them out-of-pocket expenses. Out-of-pocket. Those are specifiable damages. Medical bills, if you run into an accident. Uh, loss of contract. Um, so, for instance, uh, you know, in Hadley versus Baxendale, the flour mill was supposed to get uh, the part for uh, 100 pounds, but couldn't get it because the blacksmith failed to deliver, now had to buy the same part at 120 pounds. So the innocent party, the non-breaching party had to spend 20 more pounds, 20 more pounds and that's what you lose because the other side breach the contract. Now general damages are those damages that cannot be specified in amounts. What are general damages? Pain and suffering. Okay. Pain and suffering.
so you got hurt going through an accident. You got injured. It was painful. Can you put a dollar value on it? Very difficult. So it's not specifiable. You can only generalize about how painful it was. Also, so you have to go to hospital. Okay, you didn't feel any pain, but you have to go to hospital. You have to spend time walking over to hospital. That's suffering. Okay. You have to put dollar value on it. But it's hard. So those are general damages. And contract damages are mostly special damages. The reason is because of this consequence of damages rule. Okay. Now, consequence of damages rule exists only in the law of contracts. Doesn't exist in the law of torts. Doesn't exist in the law of properties. 물건법에도 없고 불법행위법에도 없어. 계약법에만 있어. Why? Because the purpose of the contract law is to restore the party's expectations. To restore the party's will. Not all wills, but reasonable will, well, wishes. Reasonable wishes that they mutually contemplated. Right? So the remedies is limited to the amount that compensate, compensate for what's missing from their expectations, but no more. Now, pain and suffering, it's very difficult to know in advance how much pain the other side will suffer or how much suffering the other side will suffer when I breach a contract. Okay. All right, any question, comments so far? Okay. Next. The third remedy that's available is injunctive relief. Again, the injunctive is adjective. The verbal form of injunctive is enjoin, which means order. And usually, order someone, order someone not to do something. Usually, order not to do something. That's enjoying. So usually the phrase goes like, uh, the court enjoined me from approaching my ex-wife. Uh, usually it doesn't come in the form like enjoin me enjoin me to pay so and so dollars to person X doesn't come in this form always comes in this form of preventing someone from doing something now uh, but injunctive relief, when you say injunctive relief, it's broader. It, it, it basically means court order. Now,
injunctive relief is injunctive relief has a special place in Anglo-American law. So this is what uh, separates Korean court from American court. Uh, American court of law has this crime of contempt of court. Korea도 법정 모독죄가 있죠. But it is different. Mm -hmm. 법정 모독죄는 뭐 면전에서 판사를 모욕할 때, 예를 들어서 어뭐 휴대폰 끄라 그랬는데 휴대폰을 킨다거나 녹음하지 말라 그랬는데 녹음한다거나 뭐 판사한테 소리 지른다거나 뭐 어떤 다른 이유로든. 뭐 소란을 피운다거나 그러면은 그런 행위들에 대해서 법정 내 행위들에 대해서 판사가 제재할 수 있는 it is a kind of procedural authority It's authority to uh, put people through procedure peacefully it's very limited power now contempt, contempt of court is much powerful if a court orders something and if it's not complied with, that becomes a crime. Intentional failure. Intentional failure to comply with a court order is a crime. There is no such rule in Korea. That's why so many companies, so many usually big companies in Korea are ordered to hire irregular employees into regular status. But, you know, the newspapers say, oh, the workers won. But the companies never comply. They say, oh, we would rather just pay the 이행 강제금이라고 하죠. It's cheaper to hire them as regular employees. And court cannot do anything about it in Korea. In Anglo-American court, the company not complying with a court order becomes a criminal. Now, the rules differ, the rules differ state by state, but Sometimes the same court can just become a judge on that crime. Uh, you violated my order, I find you guilty, right? It can happen that way. Um, I can do that because I'm a judge. So it doesn't even need a prosecutor, doesn't even need an indictment, right? You, are, you become a criminal right away. You, you are thrown into jail right away. So this is a very powerful remedy available in Anglo-American countries. So we say, Anglo-American country is under rule of law. 우리나라는 법치주의라고 얘기를 하죠. 그리고 보통 법치주의 번역을 rule of law라고 하는데 일부러 
룰업으로는 법의 지배라고 번역하는 사람들이 있어요. 바로 이런 차이점을 살리려고 법의 지배라고 번역을 하는 거예요. 사법부의 힘이 워낙 강력하기 때문에. 그러니까 사법부가 어떤 분쟁이 생기면 은 와서 옳고 그름을 판정해주는 행정직원이 아니고 실제로 결정을 내리고 정의가 이루어지도록 심판을 내려주는 그리고 강제하는 그런 역할까지 하는 거죠. 그래서 미국에 보면 은 쉐리프라는 거 있죠. 쉐리프. 혹시 미드도 쉐리프 있지 않나? 네. 쉐리프가 바로 법원 소속 경찰이에요. 그래서 법원이 누구 잡아오라 그러면 잡아오고 재판 나오기로 했는데 안 나온 사람 잡아오고 이런 걸 쉐리프가 하는 거예요. 경찰하고는 또 다른 역할을 하는 거죠. So now you see how how powerful injunctive relief is as a remedy. Now, because it's powerful, okay. So you've been you've been hearing the good news. Now you're gonna hear the bad news. Because it's powerful, it's more difficult to get than damages. Um, now, why it became difficult to uh, get has a history. Basically, because it's so powerful, because it, because uh, under Anglo American law, uh, injunctive relief is uh, something that does justice, that completes justice. Uh, it's not some opinion. It's not some opinion, given opinion or interpretation, uh, given by, you know, uh, bureaucrats. Um, you know, judicial uh, servants, right? Um, Anglo-American law judges are more than that. Judges are not just passive interpreters. They make sure justice is done, right? Um, but in modern society, yes, judges have so much power. But before modernization, who do you think would have those powers to do justice and make sure it's done before modernization? King, right? So, there was king's court, and there was court of law. There was court of king, there was court of law. And people first had to go to court of law to get remedies. And this court of law could issue only damages. Only judgments for damages. Now, judgment for damages, just like in Korea, it's a piece of paper. If the other side doesn't comply, you have to go through, you know, difficult enforcement process. Japan. 민사 집행법에 따라서 압류를 하고 we have to attach attachment, right? You have to attach the property, and then you have to put it on auction. 경매 부치. Right? 재산 숨기면 아무것도 못 하고. It's just a piece of paper, but. 
if the parties feel that the legal remedy is inadequate, it's not sufficient to do justice to the damage that they suffered, then they could go to king and ask for more equitable damages. So legal damages are inadequate, so please, your highness, please hand down a more equitable damages. That's why it was called court of equity. And that's why the, all these injunctive reliefs are now called equitable relief as well. Equitable relief means order, right? So, uh, so some states actually kept court of law. So, so now after modernization. So the king's power to issue equitable relief was later transferred over to the court, okay, transferred over to the court, but still some jurisdictions kept two different courts to maintain the, to maintain the dis distinction, court of law and court of equity. Some states kept that distinction until like 1960s which is fairly recent. But after that, you know, you should be thankful now that they, they, all, they went through all of that now. Now, court of equity and court of law are all merged into one. Okay. So now there is only one court of law that issues both legal relief, which is judgment for damages, and equitable relief, which is court orders. Okay? Now, they kept the requirement. They kept the requirement. They kept, they kept the stringent requirement for equitable relief, though which is that the legal relief should be inadequate. Okay? Only when legal relief is inadequate, the party can receive equitable relief. So now there are no, like, there are no law judges and equitable judges, or law judges, equity judges, or law courts, equity courts. There are only one profession, judges. They issue both remedies, but they first issue, they first want to issue remedies at law, and only when, only when the requesting party proves that legal relief or remedy at law is inadequate, then the judge will issue remedy at equity, which means equitable relief. So that's why to get injunction, to get injunction relief, you have to get, you have to prove this. Why go for injunction? Because you can use contempt in court. Right? Uh, so. When the other side breaches contract, the first thing you can get is judgment for damages. Now, if you prove that that's not sufficient remedy, then you can get a court order. So for instance, let's say you were supposed to buy a certain piece of property. That's a contract. And the other side breached the contract to sell the property to me. If I can prove that no amount of damages will be sufficient for not having the property, then I can force, okay, I can ask the court to specifically order the other side to sell the property to me. Or something like this. Let's say 
uh, you are supposed to deliver uh, my personal property, like my uh, wedding album, right? And you are supposed to deliver that, uh, but you failed in doing so. Um, and you don't want to track it down. You just want to pay, pay me money, right? So on the service country, on the delivery contract, I sue you. The judge will first want to issue judgment of money in my favor, right? Um, say ten thousand dollars. That's a lot of money for a wedding album. But I can say, oh my God, you know, this is uh, so valuable to me. Such a precious, uh, you know, asset to me. Um, that's just not. Uh, the money, no amount of money will be sufficient to sufficient uh, recovery for what I'm losing here. Uh, please, Your Honor, order the other side to track down the album and deliver to me. And that's an order. If the, if the company violates the order, go to jail. Right? Um, But only when, you know, that's possible, only when you prove that the money is inadequate. So uh, the courts usually want to issue damages first, and then issue negative injunction, means order, uh, ordering someone not to do something. And then, most remotely, most remotely, courts will be willing to issue affirmative relief. Affirmative relief is ordering party to do something affirmatively. Okay? It's not an order for someone not to do something, but it's an order for someone to do something. And that is considered more invasion on that person's freedom Right? So it is harder to get. It is harder to get. And in the law of contract, it's also called specific performance. Because you specifically ask, the order will ask the other party to specifically perform the contract. Okay? Now, uh, because of the power uh, embedded in injunctive relief, you will run into the provisions in the contract that um, the contracts where parties waive uh, right to sue for injunctive relief. Uh, why would parties do that? Well, usually because the other party wants it. Uh, Why well, the other party want it? Well, because if uh, that other party is rich enough to pay money um, and doesn't want to bother with uh, uh, performing the contract or doesn't want to bother with uh, uh, carrying out a specific performance. So waiver of injunctive relief is a provision, a provision in the contract, whereby the party gives up the right to prove inadequacy of money damages, and therefore give up the right to go for injunctive relief. It's usually requested by and obtained by the big licensees to the licensor. Uh, what do I mean by big licensee? For instance, uh, let's talk about film studio, Warner Brothers. 
okay, big one, right? And let's say they fail to pay, uh, I don't know, Tom Cruise, uh, like $100,000. Uh, Tom Cruise can sue for breach of contract and of course can get paid $100,000 but if Tom Cruise really wants to hurt Warner Brothers he can go for injunctive relief say your honor Warner Brothers breached the contract please stop them from distributing the film. Okay. And he can put a stop on the entire studio process for breaching the contract. Now, if Warner Brothers doesn't want to deal with uh, this uh, irrational, uh, vengeful conduct of Tom Cruise, they will ask for a provision that says, I can prove hereby waive my right to sue for and then to relief. That means if anything happens, you can, like, Warner Brothers can always just cover it, cover it up with the money. Right? Okay. Now, on the other hand, if you are the licensed sir, okay, and you are the you, you are the big one, if you are the big licensed sir, you are the one giving rights to the other party. And you want to make sure that you retain the right to stop the business of the other party. You want to retain the right to hurt the other party when the other party breaches the contract. Then you can ask for a provision whereby the other party waives defending your request for England to relief. So there, the other party just acknowledges that uh, just acknowledges, gives acknowledgement in advance that uh, uh, money judgment is inadequate. Injunctive relief is always available. So you, you make that, you force the other party to make that acknowledgement in advance. That's a waiver of defense to injunctive relief. Question, comment so far? Uh, you mean when you mean actual disputes? Uh, yeah, for example, why would they ask? Well, uh, in order well, to be able to stop the other party from um, conducting business. So, I, uh, it's usually in a franchise agreement. Franchise agreement, right? What is franchise agreement? Well, you basically let another company to act like you, act like your company, right? So you go to McDonald's, it's not really McDonald's, it's, a, it's another company, but they're just using McDonald's trademark, McDonald's menu, right? So from McDonald's point of view, Letting the other party act like a McDonald's has a lot of risk to their reputation, to the goodwill that they built on their brand. So when McDonald's gives a franchise to another company, right? Uh, McDonald's wants to make sure that if the franchisee Franchisee is going to be coming up travel. Uh, the franchisor is coming from Buenos. 
The franchisor wants to retain power to shut down the restaurant instead of uh, just collecting money from the franchisee. Okay. Yes, McDonald's can receive you know, a stream of money, but it's not as valuable as the reputation that you will to hit <coughs> with the brand. Of course. <laughs> Cheap. Fast food place. It's not much reputation to be protected. But, you know, even at that level, there is that expectation that people have. Uh, the sense of safety when people see McDonald's sign when they go overseas and don't know what to eat. Right? Right. Yes. for a contract, let's say B breaches the contract, can C sue B for breaching contract with A? What do you remember from your mint pop? Can C sue B for breaching contract with A? when C has no contract with either A or B. Okay. Um, look up the book again. <laughs> yes, there are times that C can. That's when C is intended beneficiary. Uh, it's written right there, intended beneficiary. Um, so if A and B enters the contract that says B agrees to deliver you know, $10,000 to C, right? 
So A, A is supposed to deliver some goods, and B is supposed to pay not A, but C. And let's say C doesn't deliver the money, and then B doesn't deliver the money. C can sue B as an intended beneficiary. Same thing with the Korean law. Check it. Okay. All right, any volunteer to check it and report back? next week all right okay yeji we'll do it i'm i'm asking people to check because i may not be updated now what does it mean intended beneficiary well a and b intended to benefit c through the performance of contract and this is what's important. C knows it. Okay? C has to know it. If A and B secretly, if A and B secretly intended, if A and B secretly intended to benefit C and C doesn't know, then C cannot sue. Okay? Because contract is all about meeting of minds. We is a habit of mind. 상대방이 모르는 상태에서 혜택을 주기로 한 거는 그거는 그런 경우 어떻게 하면 되겠어요? 그땐 A가 소송을 하면 되죠. A는 계약 당사자니까. C는 못해요. 음. How about this other question? A and B enters the contract can be assign transfer transfer the contract to C so now A and C become parties to the contract. Without A's permission. Can that happen? The answer is generally yes. Okay. But there is a big exception. If the assignment, if the assignment of contract, if the assignment of contract causes detrimental change, detrimental meaning detrimental to A, then the assignment is a void. But the default setting is, yes, you can assign a contract. But you have to make sure that there is no detriment to the other side. Uh, that's why, let's say you borrow money from a bank and you default on your payment. Uh, six months later, you know, if you don't pay, if you don't, uh, if you don't make the payment, six months later, you get a call, not from the bank you borrow money from. You get a call from a collection agency. <웃음> 전화가 왔는데 또 돈을 안 내면 더 심한 조건한테 전화가 왔고 
the reason that's possible is because the money contract, right? 금전 양수적이, 금전 대차 계약은 내가 이제 B인데 아니지 아직 내가 A고 B가 은행이에요. 은행이 계약을 다른 사람한테 넘긴다고 해가지고 Is there any detriment to me? Nothing, because all you need to do is just pay money, right? Nothing changes. Nothing changes depending on who the creditor is, at least legally, of course. Things become wildly different, depend, you know, Things become widely different whether your creditor is a, a bank or mafia, right? But legally, it's all the same. All you need to do is wire some money. Doesn't matter who is sitting on the other side of the wire. So there is no detriment. So these uh, loan contracts, these loans are bought and sold freely because changing the creditors doesn't cause any doesn't cause any detriment to the debtor. Creditor가 채권자고 debtor가 채무자고 But there are many scenarios where changing the identity of the party will cause detriment to the other side. Uh, how about employment contract? Right. I got hired. Can I just assign that employment to another person? That will cause detriment to the employer because the employer wanted you, not the other person. So that's a big exception. Actually, exception is so big that there may be more contracts that are not assignable than the ones that are assignable. Okay. All right. What is delegation? Delegation is uh, what it is. Now we have to win. So B remains. B remains a party to the contract. Uh, but delegate the other side to perform under the contract. That's delegation. What is innovation? I'm going to say something very strange. Innovation. Yeah, I'm going to say something strange. I'm going to say something strange. I'm going to say something strange. Novation. Novation is a new word. Novel. 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 Okay. Um. Mm. So that's the uh, American contract law. Any question or comment? Okay, well, let's do it this way. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break now. And, yes, oh, okay. Uh, well, I'll give you 20 minute break. I want you to use 10 minutes of that to read the sample contract that I put on Blackboard. And as you read the contract, 
uh, try to identify um, try to uh, identify the parts of the contract um, that uh, par parts of the contract where the law has operated. The contract law, uh, you know, what you learn uh, has uh, uh, become relevant. Um, so you may see a provision that says, you may see a provision that came into the contract because of some law that you just learned. Okay, so you read that, and at 6.30, I'll come back, and I'll ask you questions about what you found in the sample contract. All right. Okay, so let's look at the sample contract. Did you finish reading it? Okay, I saw full not there. So, uh, uh, what does it say at the top? What's the title? Now, let's say the Draft, you are a lawyer, and the other side, uh, your client's uh, counterpart, uh, sent a draft contract to your client without title. Right? What would you say if it comes with a, if the client says, oh, this uh, contract came but doesn't have title? What shall we do? What would you say? It doesn't matter. Right. Again, contract is about meeting of minds. As long as parties agree not to have title, it's still a valid contract. Some contracts come with a title agreement. That's meaningless. That's a waste of, uh, doesn't it? I mean, title sometimes has informational value of uh, letting people know, letting readers know in advance what they are about to read. But if it just says agreement at the top, it doesn't mean anything. So title doesn't mean anything. This agreement is made effective as of October 1st, 2004, between ABC, a Delaware limited liability company, the principal, and XYZ company limited, a blah, blah, blah corporation. What do you think, what do you think should go in to, okay, well, let's focus on contract law. This agreement is made effective as of October 1st, 2004. So when does, so this agreement is made, okay, this agreement is made on October 1st. When does it become effective? October 1st. This agreement is made as of October, uh, made and effective as of. Right. Uh, I mean, usually the agreement will say um, something like, "This agreement is entered into on October first to be effective immediately." Right. There will be 
a more standard way of um, starting the first sentence. Uh, but this is fine as well. Okay. Recitals and Okay, recitals, well as principal manufacturers, distributes makeup and cosmetics under the registered brand name ABC, which are sold in the territory through exclusive retail outlets. And well as agent, agent has marketing and sales skills and experience in the cosmetic sector in the territory and principal has agreed to appoint Agent has its exclusive agent in the territory to carry out marketing. All right. Whereas, the first whereas, is that a phrase, clause, sentence? What is it? It is a, a big clause. Okay. As you can see, um, Mm, but the second, second well is, is more like a sentence because it ends with a period, right? Um, so what I'm trying to say is reciters usually come in one full sentence and each well as is a clause. So it usually says well as blah, 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 semicolon, and well as blah 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 semicolon, well as blah 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 semicolon, and right before the last one it says well as blah 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 semicolon and well as blah 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 period. That's how it ends. Now, who is the offeror and offeree? of this contract. Who is the offerer and who is the offeree? For a contract to be valid, there has to be offer and acceptance, right? So who is an offerer and who is a offeree to accept that offer? Here, it's a trick question. They are both offerers and offerees, right? By signing an agreement together, by signing an agreement together, they are offering the promises in the contract with each other, okay? They are offering promises with each other. Um, and accepting promises from each other. Okay? Now, what's the second element of formation? Consideration. Do you find Something that satisfies the consideration requirement? Yes, it says in the uh, very last recital, it says, now therefore in consideration of the foregoing, 
and of the mutual covenants herein set forth. Right? So what is the consideration then? I mean, saying it, saying it, uh, yes, they add a phrase in consideration of blah, blah, blah to make sure that the contract satisfies the consideration requirement. But that's just a, uh, that's just a gimmick. That's just a, a icing on the cake. It is not really substance. There has to be substance, substantive consideration. Having read the contract, what do you think is the consideration? What do you think is the bargain between the parties? What is being exchanged? If you are if you are a grocer and I'm a customer, you give me apples, I give you money, right? In this contract, what are the promises being exchanged? Marketing and sales services. Hmm? Service provided by who? Agents. Okay. And in exchange, there has to be something in exchange, right? What what do they get? What do they get from ABC? What do they get from principal in exchange for providing the marketing services? Okay, what kind of money? Where, where do you see it? Part of the sales money. And you call that? What do you call that? Commission. Okay, what clause? Okay, good. Section 6. Okay. Now, That's good. So commission and other compensations. So in consideration of the services. Now, what's happening is I'll provide the service. Okay, I'll provide the service. You give me commission when I provide the service. Okay, so these are like future considerations. Is there any present consideration? Do you see any other bargain? See, when you get a contract, uh, noticing what the bargain is, is the most important thing. Is there anything that any benefit the parties are exchanging with each other now by signing this contract. Now, make no mistake, not all contracts have to have present consideration. Future promises, or I mean present promises of future services or present promise of a future consideration are all valid makeup of a contract. But I'm just asking, is there also present promises? Promise that's effective right now that the parties are exchanging with each other. right now so that you know it's like giving money for the services you cannot violate that contract now right because uh, you provide service first and then you pay money and get paid money but is there something that parties can violate right now So if you, if you look at 
Okay, if you look at 2.1. Subject to all terms and conditions of this agreement, principal agrees to engage agent on an exclusive basis. An agent agrees to provide marketing, sales, support, and distribution management services to principal in connection with the sale by principal of the products in the territory. So now XYZ becomes ex exclusive agent for ABC inside the territory. Now notice that T is a capital T. That means it is a defined term. Territory가 뭔가 사전 찾아볼 필요 없어요. 계약서 안에 정의가 돼 있어요. 그러면 항상 대문자로 써 있어요. So, because now XYZ is the exclusive agent, ABC cannot appoint any other agent in that territory. Okay? That's a promise that, it, that becomes immediately effective. So that's a promise that ABC can break right now. Okay. Look at 2.4. Sales outside the territory. Agent agrees that it will neither sell nor assist in any way directly or indirectly any person to sell. It will neither sell nor assist somebody else to sell the products to persons outside the territory. So here, XYZ, in exchange for becoming exclusive, in exchange of being appointed exclusive agent, it is promising not to conduct business outside the territory. So those are the bargains. Now, there are other aspects of the bargain. The bargains are not like one to one. Right? It can be two to three. It can be four to three. Right? But there are other aspects of the bargain, but that is an important aspect of the bargain. If you cannot find the bargain, okay, you get a draft. If you cannot find what the bargain is, what the main bargains are, don't start talking to your client. Okay? Figure that out first. Because that's the whole purpose of entering into a contract. If the bargain is not there, you can tell your client, oh, you don't need to enter into this contract because there is no bargain here. And she will, and, and you can tell him, you know, save your money. Don't spend on me. Your client will appreciate that very much. I've done this several times. They love it. Okay. Instead of spending another $5,000 on signing a contract, uh, they can spend money on something more valuable for the company. All right. What's the third? So we are going through the elements of uh, contract formation. We established who the offer of we are. We established what the consideration is. Now we need to establish what? What's the third element? Capacity. All right. Capacity of who? Capacity of the offerer and offeree, the capacity of the persons who are going through the ceremony of entering into the contract. What's the ceremony of entering into a contract? Signing it, right? So what do you have to do? You have to go all the way down to see who is signing it. Okay? So if you're a client, comes to you 
and shows you this agreement all the way at the bottom it says in witness well of the parties have by their respective duly authorized representatives executed this agreement as of the as of the day and the year first above written what's the day and the year first above written remember october 1st 2004 and it says by name title by name title and if you represent xyz what will you tell your client if you are representing xyz How do you establish capacity of the other side so that the other side cannot repudiate the contract? Through express authority or implied authority or apparent authority? Apparent authority, right? Because express authority comes from the act of the express act of delegating the signing power but you have no idea whether the CEO of the company has called this person what's his name Nicholas right to actually sign this agreement it's hard to prove that there was express delegation Implied authority, authority is implied from the position of the person and the user duties of that person. But yes, you have some idea what Nicholas' position is in the other side's company, but again, you have limited information. So, you have to establish capacity of the other side. The capacity of the other side is not a good Capacity of the other side is not a good thing. You do that by establishing apparent authority. Apparent authority. Apparent. 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 그 사람의 직함을 쓰도록 하고 그리고 그 사람이 그러니까 니콜라스라는 게 중요한 게 아니라 그러니까 직함은 implied authority 직함만 보면 implied authority에서 중요한 거고 apparent authority는 그 직함과 그 과거의 경험 이런 걸다 따져서 상대방이 보기에 아, 이 사람과 계약을 서명하면 저 회사와 계약이 성립되는구나 라고 믿을 만한 그런 사람인지 확인을 해야 되는 거죠. 물론 거기서 제일 중요한 건 우선 직함이 중요해요. 네. 근데 직함에 거의 다 authorized representative라고 돼 있으면 안 돼요. 그거는 express authority를 받은 사람을 지명할 때 authorized representative라고 하는 거거든요. 그럼 파워 오브 어터니를 들고 나오면 누군가 파워 오브 어터니를 들고 나오면 다 어드라이즈 레퍼런스가 되는 거죠. 
자, 어, 오케이. Okay, now we go to the condition. Now, what is the condition? So after signing, right? After you enter into the agreement, after contract is contract properly formed, formed. But when does it become effective? Right? Is there a condition to be satisfied for the contract to be effective? Did you find any? Is there any condition pressed? Up? Is there any condition subsequent? Effective date, okay, but it says effective, made effective as of, so they wrote it so that it is made and effective on the same day. So there's really no condition precedent, okay. Now let's say you want to make sure, let's say you are representing a Okay, you don't have to represent any company. Uh, okay, let's say you are still representing XYZ, and what if you want to make sure that your client knows exactly when it becomes effective? What would you recommend to your client? You, rec you recommend either signing it last, right, or adding a condition precedent that a contract shall become effective subject to condition precedent. Okay, contract shall become effective subject to the condition precedent that delivery of the counter-side counter -side contract is delivered to XYZ. That way you will know, your client will know exactly when contract has been fully entered into. All right. Okay, how about discharge? Are there provisions that concern forgiving the other side for not performing? Force majeure. Okay. What section is it? Uh, article 11. 11.4. All right. Okay. Uh, Parties shall not be responsible for failure to perform here under due to force measure, which shall include, but not limited to. Why don't you read the whole paragraph out loud now? Party shall not be responsible for
Okay, good. Uh, do you see anything wrong with it? Let's say we are representing x, y, z. And let's assume, okay, let's assume that uh, you are um, let's assume that you are uh, entering into contract on behalf of uh, on behalf of uh, ABC, and ABC is supposed to perform, and you are supposed to collect commission on the amount of uh, goods sold by the principal ABC to third parties. And if uh, ABC doesn't perform, if ABC doesn't deliver, then you don't get any commission. Okay? All right, let's assume that. Now, if you were representing X, Y, Z, would you change anything on 11.4? For whom is it more favorable? 11.4. For whom is it working for? The agent or the principal? Okay, why agent? Okay, it will. Uh, it will not affect one's ability to give commissions, but it will affect the agent's ability to perform services. Okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, whoever is delivering goods and services will benefit more, right, from the force majeure than the party receiving, uh, than the party just sending money off to the other side. Um, Okay, actually that's the side I didn't think about. The other side that you should think about is after agent enters into the contract, if uh, ABC, ABC now has to sell the goods. Okay. The whole purpose of the contract is ABC selling it in the territory. ABC selling its goods in the territory and XYZ will enter into contract on XYZ, uh, on ABC's behalf. Now, if uh, ABC doesn't deliver the contract, doesn't deliver the goods, doesn't deliver the products, that's why it suffers in terms of uh, commissions that it was supposed to get. Right? So this works in favor of principle as well. Right? And then there are other contracts where this you know, whether the uh, uh, risk and benefit of a force majeure is much more lopsided, much more clearly for one side than the other. Uh, from my experience, I think I say this is more in favor of the principle. Other lawyers may differ, but I think principle you can benefit from this provision for its failure to deliver the goods on time. Um, now, do you see anything that um, 
So let's say, you know, for whatever reason, let's say you want to tone down force module clause. Okay. What would you take out? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. Um, and also, I'll take out any cause beyond the reasonable control of a party. Okay. That means if something happens, if something beyond reasonable control of a party, then the parties are never responsible for breach. It's very broad, very, very broad force module clause. All right, we talked about condition, we talked about uh, discharge situation. How about provisions affecting the definition of breach? I told you there are provisions that provisions or structures of a contract that affect definition of when a breach takes place. The first is the minimus versus material breach. Right? Uh, Second, well, actually, first was time to cure. Is there a time to cure provision? We talked about this, right? Let's look at it again. And also, the minimus material breach, that, I mean, that does need the provision to be effective. Uh, is there? AdSense provision? Is there a provision that makes something so critical that any deviance from the contract term will immediately become a breach? Where is it? Okay, okay. Such failure continues, but it says, and such failure continues for a period of 30 days from agents to receive a written notice given by a principal requiring such payment. So actually, this is not an AdSense provision. Actually, this is a time to cure provision. It gives 30 days time to cure. And paragraph B also says the same thing. Agreement may be terminated by principal if agent has breached or is in default in the performance of any material obligation. See, they are material, right? A material, 재료, 이렇게 번역하면 안 되죠. 중대한 이런 뜻이죠. 상당한, 뭐, obligation under this agreement. Other than agents, I will refer to section 8.3a. And such default has not been cured within 30 days after receipt of written notice of such default. Cure. Okay. So both A and B are time to cure provisions. So if I say, oh, is something of AdSense in this agreement? I say nothing. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, finally, remedies. Are there provisions that affect? Remedies in this agreement. Okay. 9.3. Right? That's what you're talking about. Yeah. It says, upon termination of this agreement, for any reason, neither party shall be liable for any special, indirect, incidental, punitive, or consequential damages 
regarding such termination irrespective of whether such obligations or liabilities may be contemplated in any law applicable within the territory or elsewhere or and except as otherwise provided by applicable law each party hereby waives and relinquishes any rights pursuant to law or otherwise to any such damages. The remedies contained herein shall be exclusive. Okay. All right. Uh, what do you learn from here as to the remedies? That's a possible interpretation. Um, now, what is confusing a lot of people is the term special there, because contract damages are um, special damages. But here, 제가 consequential damages에 대해서도 그 거꾸로 가리키는 분들이 있다 그랬죠. Special damages도 거꾸로 쓰는 분들이 있어요. Okay, specially, 뭔가 좀, 어, 그러니까 특정된 피해가 아니라 특별한 피해라는 뜻으로 어, 쓸 때가 있는데 지금 이건 그렇게 쓰고 있는 거예요. 그래서 보통 special, incidental, consequential 그 이런 이 관행구에서 나올 때는 어, 진짜 특별한, 예상하지 못했던 그런 거 얘기합니다. 어, 하지만 general damage와 special damage는 이 법리적으로 special damage와 저희 general damage는 제가 말씀드린 용법이 맞습니다. 어, 변호사들끼리 special damage 얘기를 한다는 것은 음, 실제로는 그 특정 가능한 금액의 손해배상을 실제로 얘기하는 거예요. <웃음> 그래서 여기서 스페셜 데미지스는 이제 받지 못하게 한다고 해서 그러면 뭐 아무도 못 받는 거 아니냐 이렇게 생각하면 안 돼요. 그래서는 특별한 손해 네. 얘기하는 거. Regarding such termination, irrespective of whether such a reason or not, can't be any law. 자 그리고 uh, the remedies contained herein shall be exclusive. 그 레미리는 이거 말고는 없다 이런 얘기죠. 그러면 여기서 무슨 일이 일어나는 거예요? 인정트 릴리브는 인정트 릴리브를 웨이브한 거예요. 네. 그래서 웨이브한다는 말을 안 쓰고 웨이브를 한 거예요. 그렇죠. 그러니까 계약 위반에 따른 어, 통상적인 손해는 청구할 수 있다는 겁니다. 그리고 어, 조금 이제 더 나아가면 음, 자, 잠깐만 봅시다. 그 계약서에 보면 인덴니티라고 10.1 okay. 아리클 10그 X라고 되어 있는 거 로먼 유머럴 10이죠 아리클 10에 인덴니피케이션 앤 인슈런스라고 되어 있죠 인덴니피케이션도 uh, 이게 uh, 그 아주 헷갈리게 사람들 헷갈리게 하는 말이에요. 왜냐하면 인덴니티스는 우선 배상이라는 뜻이에요. 어, 그래서 인덴니티도 배상 이런 의미입니다. 그런데 어, 그 배상이라고 하면은 그냥 뭐 데미지스라고 해도 되는데 어, 인덴니티케이션이라는 걸쓸 때는 어, 뭔가 그 제3자에게 배상해주는 
آره بس دال پار این دمنفیکیشن بس بومیان 10.1 دو تر خاتی دیگه باشد پرنسپل این دمنری پرنسپل اگریز دورین این افتر دو ترم با دیس اگریمن تو این دمنفی and hold harmless agent from liability, loss, cost, or damage which agent may incur as a result of claims, damages, or judgments, or any kind of nature. That's the same thing to show you. Hold harmless. Hold harmless. Hold harmless. If you indemnify and hold harmless, then you can show you the same thing. Um, 그리고 10점 이에 보면은 um, agent agrees during and after the time of this agreement to indemnify and hold down his principal from liability, loss, cost or damage. 자, 이거는 사실 이제 계약 그 이제 구체적인 계약 조항이라서 지금 다루려고 한건 아니고 여기서 이제 보여주려고 한 거는 그 괄호 안에 보면 including reasonable attorney's fee라고 돼 있죠. 이건 뭐냐면 변호사 비용까지 이제 다 벌어준다는 얘기죠. 어, 그래서 그 예를 들어서 나 계약을 위반을 해서 XYZ가 계약을 위반을 해서 ABC한테 피해가 발생했다. 그러면 그거를 피해가 발생하지 않게 보호해줘야 되는 의무가 있고 그 보호 중 의무 중에 하나는 이렇게 해서 ABC가 변호사 병원에 변호사 병원까지 해줍니다. 아주 강력한 거. 오케이. Do you find any provision that affect? Do you find any provision that affect? The third party relationship. Yes. What does it say? Successors, assigns, beneficiaries of the parties. Provided that this agreement is in personal to agent who shall not assign this agreement or any rights obligations here under, whether by operation of law, okay, or otherwise, and all otherwise in the English type one, you know, by operation of law or otherwise, without the prior written consent of the principal, which consent may be withheld or granted with or without conditions in its sole discretion. Any attempted assignment without requisite written consent shall be void and unenforceable. If you have any assignment, then you can't do it. Any detrimental change, you can't do it. Okay, good. All right. Let's find. Why don't you go find a contract that you like to discuss in class, right? And then go through exercise like the one we just went through in class. So just go Google. You know, uh, try to find uh, English language contract. Now some of them will be really long, some of them will be short. Uh, it doesn't have to be agency agreement. It can be two, three page contract. Let's okay. find it. And then go through the elements of contract law that we just discussed. And we'll 
uh, have each of you go through that. Okay. Uh, now, I'm gonna put something on the blackboard now. I'll give you um, another 10 minutes to just skim it and I'll come back to give a 20 minute lecture on it and then we'll be done, okay? Mm -hmm.
자, 올라가세요. 예, 읽어보세요. 네. 이거 보고 앞에 음, 앞에 다섯 개 정도만 보세요. 
Okay. So what you're about to see is So what you're about to see, you can you can look at your own copy, um, is basically outline for the uh, entirety of the rest of the semester. Uh, of course, it will be uh, augmented by uh, many sample contracts, and I put on Blackboard those sample contracts as well. Uh, but this is the outline. Okay, we learn about types business types of uh, five types of business contracts, and these are basic building blocks that will be used over and again and in combination, or in sometimes modified forms. But if you understand these types, these five basic types, then you are pretty safe. I would say. So distributorship. Repeat after me. Distributorship. Distribution. Agency. Agency. License. License. Service. 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 Sale and purchase agreement. Sale and purchase agreement. These five types are the basic building blocks. Now there are uh, kind of the sub groups. These are kind of subgroups that belong to these basic groups. OEM agreement, a lot of people think it differently from distributorship, but as I studied OEM, it is kind of distributorship agreement, and I'll explain why. And sales representative. Why do you have sales representative? Because you cannot do the sale yourself. And usually in foreign countries, you set up sales representative. And there are different ways of setting up sales representative. One is by setting up a distributorship. Another way is setting up agency. Those are two different types of sales representative. And license. That is for intellectual property. Uh, franchise is one form of license agreement. A lot of people think it is a different from license, but it is a subgroup within a license agreement. Um, lease agreement can be uh, similar to license agreement as well. Service agreement, you know all, you know what that is. Yongyeok gas. Now, development agreement is a subgroup of service agreement, where service results in intellectual properties. So if the service is for developing new technology or new contents, then that contract is called the development contract. Set and purchase. Well, you know that already. Right. All right, we'll start with the distributor agreement. Who are the parties to distributor agreement? Repeat after me. Supplier. Supplier. Distributor. distributor. Now, what distributor does is buying something and then selling. So it's also called reseller. Now that is different from dealer or agency. Okay. Now, when you go buy stuff, there are times that you buy from dealers, and there are times that you just buy from distributors. Okay. When do you buy from a dealer? So, 
자동차 사본 사람 없어요? 네. 자동차를 사면 예를 들어서 뭐 주변에 어, 뭐 현대자동차 마크 있는 이제 점포에 가면 차를 사는데 그 점포는 현대자동차 와 관련 없는 회사의 가능성이 높아요. 직영점도 있어요. 직영점도 있는데 대리점이 훨씬 더 많아요. 대리점을 말합니다. 딜러가. 딜러 에이전시 다 대리점을 뜻하는 말이에요. 그래서 거기서 자동차를 사면 계약서에 보면 도장이 현대자동차 정, 지금 회장이 누구야? 정몽구. 네, 그렇게 돼 있어요. 그, 그, 계약을. 근데 거기 차를 여러분한테 판 사람은 현대 자동차 직원이 아니야. 아, 아니, 대리점이라면. 네. 직영점이라면은 뭐 직원이 했을 테지만, 아, 대리점은 현대 자동차와는 관계 없는 회사예요. 그냥 이 에이전스 어그리먼트를 맺은 독립적인 회사일 뿐이에요. 회사, 회사이거나 이제 그냥 개인이거나. 어, 그래서 리셀러, 디시뷰러가 한쪽에 있고 딜러하고 에이전스가 다른 쪽에 있고 그래서 다, 다 합쳐서 셀즈 라피언티브라고 보고 딜러 에이전스는 보통은 이렇게 좀 비싼 물건 그러니까 중간에 매개하는 사람이 사서 팔기에는 너무 비싸서 부담하기가 어려운 거 이런 거는 다 딜러십에서 딜러십을 통해서 팔게 됩니다. 그래서 안마 의자 이런 거 딜러 피아노 딜러 그리고 뭐 스테레오 시스템도 아주 비싼 것들은 그 가게 애가 사는 게 아니라 그냥 팔아주는 거예요. 음. 자, 디스비러십에서 어, 디스비러어그리먼트를 가져오면 여러분들이 가장 먼저 봐야 되는 거는 자, 계약서 보면 컨스터레이션을 읽어야 된다고 했죠. 그럼 디스비러십 어그리먼트에서는 컨스터레이션이 뭐냐면 익스클루시브 익스클루시비티 즉 테리토리를 정해주고 Inside this territory, you are the exclusive distributor. Right? Now, if the distributor agreement, a copy of the distributor agreement that you got from your client, right? And the client says, you know, he got it from his counterpart, right? If it doesn't have an exclusive provision, you should seriously ask your client to think about whether to even enter into a distributorship agreement. Because if there is no consideration, then it's a meaningless contract. All right? Because the reason that you enter into a distributor agreement Yes, is to sell in long term, right? To sell your products in long term. But signing distributorship agreement doesn't really obligate parties to buy and sell. There, is, there are provisions about how to buy and sell, right? So I, I told you about like five basic types, right? Now, sale and purchase agreement obligates parties to actually buy and sell. Distributorship agreement doesn't do that. Distributor agreement just 
sets out the procedure by which to buy and sell. Signing distributor agreement doesn't raise revenue for anybody. Why do people enter into distributor agreement? Or to appoint a person to sell your products in your, in your place. Either by becoming a reseller or either becoming an agent of you, right? Now, if I'm becoming an agent, right, if I'm becoming an agent, I would love to be the exclusive agent in a certain territory. If I become a distributor, I would love to become exclusive distributor of a certain territory. Otherwise, if I spend a lot of time promoting, advertising this product, right, in the territory, and you make the public like this product, if I'm not the exclusive agent or distributor, some other agent and distributor will reap the profit. Right? They'll get the free lunch at the expense of my work. Also from the uh, supplier's point of view, if you appoint two, if you appoint more than one distributor or agent, in a certain territory, what's going to happen is the two or the distributors and agents will wait for other distributors and agents to spend money on advertising promotion so that they can get a free ride on the reputation of the product that others build. In the end, it will be like chicken game, right? You do it first. No, you do it first. If nobody does, we'll all die. Well, I don't care dying. I'm not going to do first. You do it first. In the end, no one company, no one distributor or agent will have incentive to do the first promotion and advertising campaign for the product. And there will not be many orders for the product that you, the supplier, is making. So the reason that the economics behind the distributor agreement is to make that bargain, right? You become exclusive, you become exclusiver for the territory. So now you have incentive to invest Right? Invest in providing good information, accurate, top quality, also usually the distributor does after services too, okay? post-sale services. So now they have incentives to provide very good services. Okay. Uh, and even for like setting up nice uh, showrooms, right? Because what ends up happening is, if, uh, um, if one distributor sets up very nice showroom, well, you know, they serve you wine waiting for, right? Uh, then another distributor, instead of uh, spending money on building a nice showroom, will cut the price, right? What ends up happening will be a lot of people will go to the showroom to try out the product, but buy it from the other distributor. We do that all the time too, right? We go to Yongsan to look at the electronics and come back and order from online, right? So to prevent that problem, you need to have, you need to set up exclusive relationship. Now, if there is no Bargain. If there is no such bargain, then entering into distributors of agreement may be a waste of money. 
Yes, distributorship agreement. Uh, there is a one benefit of a uh, uh, distributor uh, entering into non-exclusive distributorship agreement is you now can allow the distributor to use this sign. We are the authorized distributor. Okay. But what does it mean, authorized distributor? Right. It's like, let's say I bought this notebook from you. Right? Just one notebook. And I sell to other people. I'm a distributor. I buy this notebook, sell to I'm a distributor. Right. What does it mean, authorized distributor? Okay. You, you'll see this. You'll see this in contract. That means there is a contract. Right? I mean, buying this from you doesn't require a contract. Right? I just give you money and can take it. Same thing. I can give you money and take it. But instead of doing that, you and I set up a relationship whereby, you know, we can kind of control prices, control the process of ordering and receiving products, right? So you will see in the advertisement, uh, we are the authorized distributors of uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, that's good, you have a contract, but you are not the only one who can sell things, right? Other people can sell things as well, okay? So, this is a, a kind of a maxim that uh, I uh, uh, thought of. This will Ship contract, D slash KN, that's distributorship, shorthand for distributor contract. Distributorship contract is not a contract to sell, but a contract not to sell. Okay? It's not a contract to sell, but it's a contract not to sell. Who's the one not selling? The supplier. Supplier, by giving exclusivity, to the exclusive distributor is making a promise that it's not going to sell the product in the territory. That's the core consideration. Okay. All right, time's up. Think about it. And I'll see you next week.